All right, everyone, Jackson Howell with Saints from the South. Uh, today, we are going to be releasing an interview that we did with Dale McCullers. Dale is a native of Live Oak, Florida, where he attended Suwannee High School and grew up around the famed Suwannee River. He was a classic farm boy where he worked in the tobacco fields, as well as in his grandfather's furniture store. He met his wife, Nell, in the fifth grade, and they started dating in high school. They both attended Florida State University together and ended up marrying during their senior year in 1968. As an All-American linebacker at FSU, he actually holds the Florida State and NCAA tackles record for a single game. After they graduated, he went on and had a short career in the NFL for about four years where he played for the Miami Dolphins and Baltimore Colts. He was a member of the Super Bowl V team in 1970. While Nell pursued her career in education and as a social worker for 25 years, Dale went on to work for NCIS as a special agent for 24 years. As far as their service in the church, both have served extensively. Dale has served as a branch president, a bishop, a stake president, and in many other callings. Nell has been right there by his side, serving in many callings as well. They've also had some time working in the Atlanta and Orlando temples. They've been married for 52 years and counting, have four children, eight grandchildren. While in retirement, they keep themselves busy working at their farm and helping others in the community and currently anxiously waiting for the Tallahassee, Florida Temple to open up as soon as possible so that they can hopefully serve a mission there. Enjoy the interview. All right. Well, today we have Dale McCullers on the show with us. So, uh, Dale, thank you so much for, for being here. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. Absolutely. Well, we'll go ahead and uh, and jump right in. Um, first, just kind of we want to kind of find out uh, a little bit of the background on on Dale McCuller. So, if you would just give us a little bit of your childhood upbringing and so forth. So, okay, I'm a native of Live Oak, Florida. I was born in the Lake Shore Hospital in Lake City, Florida. I think I weighed ten pounds, eleven ounces. At nice. Birth, so I was a big boy from the very beginning. My formative years. My dad was in the military. He was an army officer, mother, a housewife. And we lived in Jacksonville, Augusta, Georgia, and Columbia, South Carolina on military bases during my early life. We ended up in Jacksonville, Florida, where dad uh, ran an induction center, army induction center. My parents divorced when I was five. I had an older brother and a younger sister, and we ended up in Live Oak, uh, where my maternal grandparents lived, Annie and Oscar Green. So I was reared primarily by my mother and grandparents okay. in Live Oak. Attended uh, Swanee County schools in Live Oak, uh, graduated. Ended up going to uh, Florida State on a football scholarship. And after my uh, brief uh, college and well, four years college ball, and I, I played three seasons in one training camp in the pros with the uh, Dolphins. I don't know if you recall the Dolphin history, but Shula took his team to the Super Bowl 1972. Okay. I was there 69 and 70. Okay. The year that he came down, he traded a bunch of us or let quite a few got put on waivers. There was a player strike that year, and I ended up getting picked up by Baltimore, which was the Baltimore Colts. Right. And I played one season in a training camp. The season was 1969. In 1970, we ended up in the Super Bowl five. So just by default, you know, finding a team, landing on a team. Um, I was not a starter. I backed up two all pros. Okay. Was on all special units and that type of thing. <clears throat> and uh, my second year, I got put on waivers. I was had an interview with the uh, Atlanta Falcons, but elected to pursue a real career. Right. So, uh, people don't realize that the average employment span of a football player is only four to five years. Right. Yeah. You're real lucky if you get a 10 year career. Right. 
you know, depending on how much money the owners have invested in you. And so I was fortunate enough to play, retired from pro football and went, my degree was in law enforcement. I was a criminology major at FSU and I ended up uh, interviewing eventually. I was with the state attorney in, in a Live Oak for three years and then got picked up by NCIS, which was at that time, it was called NIS, Naval Investigative Service. Okay. Or Naval Intelligence, which is a contradicting term. But uh, anyway, uh, NCIS changed its name in the late 80s to NCIS. And of course, you heard of the TV program. Right. And uh, spent 23 years with them. Retired fully in 2006. Uh, worked for three years with the Homeland Security Department as an instructor. Okay. Uh, so that's my spiel. My wife, a school teacher, she actually earned her uh, master's in education while, uh, you know, following me around the world. And in bits and pieces, she'd get her degree, and she finally got her master's in education. She retired with 22 years from the Georgia school school retirement wow. system so we both we ended up in uh waycross okay yeah well that's uh quite the quite the career and i would uh if i understand correctly with the uh with the with the nfl the salaries back then were a little less than what they are today right oh uh, yes paltry i think with super bowl money in 1970 we got each player got 25 grand it didn't matter if you were a specialty team or a water boy, right? Uh, practice squad, whatever you got 25,000. So I think I earned my last year, it was $66,000. The sign of the beast, six. Wow, six. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, today, you know, that's chicken okay. feed to some of these guys. Right. So I came that's along right. too early, right? Yeah, I hear you. Um, so as far as your uh, childhood is concerned, um, were you brought up in a church at all? or No, religious I'm a convert background? to the church. Uh, I was born and reared by uh, grandparents and mother who were Advent Christian faith, very similar to the Methodist faith. Was very active in Boy Scouts. And uh, in college, I was active in Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Okay. Um, actually spoke at many Baptist churches beginning in my collegiate career and pro, pro football career, you know, a Christian message of some sort. Okay. Mainly it was a motivational speaker for youth, youth events in different right. churches. So, you, so but before you joined the church, you obviously had a good uh, religious I foundation. I had a good foundation. My mother was a, I'd, I'd call her religious zealot, uh, Mother had uh, some issues. Uh, she had some mental health issues, and she was in and out of her home. So we were reared primarily by our grandparents, and and they were staunch in their religious beliefs. And, gotcha. Uh, 1974 is when I was introduced to the church. Okay. And I don't know if you want to go into my conversion story. But yeah, Absolutely. It was about 1974, so I was roughly 25, 26 years old, married, had uh, only one child, a daughter, Kimberly, who is now lives in uh, Sandy, Utah, okay. and she has two daughters. Uh, <clears throat> I was needing a pickup truck to go to work. I worked at the Department of Corrections. Um, no, excuse me, that was earlier. I worked at the Florida Shirts Boys Ranch. I was a counselor. So, so, so this is this is after your pro, NFL pro football okay. over. Like I said, I had to get a real job. Right. And uh, it's kind of funny in a way. I went from the penthouse to the outhouse in terms of salary. I went from sixty-six grand back in nineteen sixty-nine. That's pretty big money. Oh yeah. To uh, I think my first year with the Department of Corrections was eighty-two hundred. Wow. So it was a big pay cut. Yeah. And they all being a teacher, you know, our combined income, we we struggled. 
But anyway, we were needing a car. Uh, Nell was working. She was a social worker. It was before she got into teaching. And I was uh, working at the Sheriff's Boys Ranch in uh, northern Florida. So I decided to get a pickup truck. And I walked onto a used car lot. And little did I know, the salesman owner of the car lot was uh, the branch president of the Mormon church there. Okay. So that's how it started. Uh, if you'd like for me, I can go into detail. About yeah, yeah I'd, love, yeah, I'd love to hear that. <clears throat> I don't want to bore the audience, but, you know, the convert story is dear to all of our hearts. Mm -hmm. You know, as you listen to conversion stories, there's something in there that you know is not coincidence, just about every conversion story. And converts is what keeps the lifeblood of the church flowing, I think. Right. You know, the new energy and new, right, new yeah. blood. Anyway, uh, I told Mr. Poole, was the name of that car lot owner, I was looking for a pickup truck, and he immediately began asking me questions about sports, you know, because in my hometown, fairly big deal to have a pro player. Right, yeah. So he said, aren't you Dale McCullers? He did his fingers like that. And I said, yeah, yeah. He said, didn't you play at FSU? And I said, yeah, yeah. You know, standard patter for asking questions. Right. And he said, well, that's good. He said, what are you looking for? And I told him, and he said, I can get you the truck. I'll have it here tomorrow. He, he described a truck that he thought would be perfect. I said, well, that's good. I'm interested. He said, I want you to forget about the truck for just a minute. And I said, oh, my goodness. He's about to sell me Amway or. Right, right. Yeah. Or something, so, something on the side. Some kind of sales pitch. And he, he looked me square in the eye, Jackson, and said, uh, I want to tell you about an angel named Moroni. Just like that. He said, have you ever heard of the angel Moroni? I said, no, I have not. He said, I've heard of Gabriel and different angels in the Bible, but I never heard of Moroni. So he said, come into my office. And I followed him like a little sheep into his office. And he sat down. He drew out the plan of salvation on a piece of paper, where we came from, why we're here, where we're going. He talked about the Book of Mormon, the Restoration, Joseph Smith. And I remember to this very moment right now, him tapping with his finger and said, wouldn't you like to know more about this? And I can't tell you that I wanted to know more, but I remember what I felt. I felt the spirit uh, in, in a uniquely profound way that he was bearing his testimony. And what he shared was interesting. It was very interesting. I said, yeah, I'd like to know more. I think I would. I've always been kind of an open-minded person. So I go home. He makes an appointment with the missionaries. By the way, they were on his car lot at the time, washing their car. It was P-Day. Okay. And he whistled out the window, hey, missionary, come in here and meet Dale McCullers. Made the appointment. I go home, tell Nell that I've got the Mormon missionaries right. coming. And she said, well, I won't be here. Wow. And uh, it was a tough couple of weeks there because I had the missionaries and they all wasn't there. And I listened to the first two discussions. I knew it was true. The second discussion, I knew it was true. I persuaded Nell to listen, just listen. And the first discussion they had with Nell and I together, she knew it was true. We, we laid in bed at night. We talked about it. And she said the same thing I, I said. It's how I feel more than what I know. Right. But what got now when they showed the 12 apostles in their old flip chart. Right. Used to have an old flip chart. And they showed the 12 apostles in business suits, all in business suit. And it clicked with now. Comparing the ancient primitive church to the modern day church. And that night she said, you know, that makes so much sense to me that 12 apostles 
would be here today. Right. And why don't we have them? And why don't we have a prophet? You know, she began to convert me even, you know, longer story short, we went through all the discussions. I wanted to be baptized and Nell and her family pitched a big fit, you know, in opposition. Uh, I even had my own family members, my grandparents who raised me, haven't Christian, right. uh, told Nell that they would pay for a divorce. Wow. If I joined the Mormon church. Wow. So, uh, to make a longer story short, there was a real difficult period there of about six weeks where I wanted to be baptized. I knew it was true. And what was so flabbergasting, they all knew it was true. But her parents were very mm -hmm. much against, against it. it. And being in a small town, it was difficult to say the least. So I won't go into great a lengthy commentary, but I postponed my baptism just to let things cool off. And we moved. We happened to move. And we moved away from Live Oak. Went to Lake Butler, Florida. First thing I know, the Mormon missionaries and the home teachers show up at my house. Wow. <laughs> up at my you're, not house. Get, you're not getting away. <laughs> not getting away. So Mormon missionaries and uh, well-known uh, convert to the church named Wilford Jordan, who was a tremendous missionary for the church. Mars Poole, who baptized me, the Carlot man, mm -hmm. and Wilford Jordan, those two men had baptized personally over 500 people each. Wow. And brought them into so, the church. So Wilford Jordan became my home teacher. And longer story short, one day, I decided to go pray again about my conversion. And while praying, I walked I walked down along a river, the Swanee River. I was in my hometown again, out at the boys' ranch. I was out at the boys' ranch near the Swanee River. And there was a trail that went back along the riverbank for about two miles. And I was walking and I looked around, I went around completely long. I didn't kneel. I just bowed my head and said, you know, if it's for me to join the Mormon church. And I was sincere, very sincere. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't want to sign, but I, I want to feel that it's the right thing to do. I don't want to have a divorce, you know. With right, my right. So I got it there, started walking back and within I'd say 10 to 15 yards from where I stood and prayed. Down on the ground was a folded up piece of stationery, wet. It was wet, like the night before. So I unfolded this piece of stationery, and it was a typewritten letter from the director of the, of the uh, boys' ranch to one of the ranchers, see, they, what happened at the boys ranch, they have neglected, dependent youth in trouble with the law right. or no parents or that kind of thing. The letter was directed to one of the ranchers who was a senior in high school. And the narrative of the letter was he was encouraging him to go ahead and serve his Mormon mission for the Mormon church. Wow. This non-member was telling this telling uh, rancher, member, right, yeah. rancher, I think it's a wonderful thing. The Mormon people are great people and you should serve your mission and with pride. And, you know, you'll be a great pride to the Florida Church Boys Ranch, you know, and it's signed by the director. So, of course, I'm looking around saying, who planted this letter? <laughs> Somebody planted this letter. Right, yeah. But nobody did. And the Lord uh, did. Coincidence after coincidence. Yeah. Happened. And I would come home. I, I got baptized. And they all noticed a big change in me. I quit drinking. I was a semi-alcoholic. I was not an alcoholic, but very close to it. And <clears throat> she noticed I changed and was more serious about life and about her marriage and children. And 
Uh, I'd catch now reading the ensign, I don't, uh, some, you know, yeah. order magazine. I'd catch her reading some of the pamphlets of missionaries. Uh, before long, she asked me to baptize her. Okay. So that's yeah. it in a nutshell. Uh, well, yeah, that's a uh, that's a that's a great great story. I was I was going to ask, but I think you answered it anyway. I was going to ask the uh, the car dealer there if he if he was just a missionary minded individual and if he kind of extended invitations to people often like that, or if you were one of those where he got a prompting and saying, "Hey, you know." I think he was just a person that did every every customer that came in here he, was, he had a reputation i learned later that if you were going to buy a car from him you're going to hear about the church there, hey yeah there you go <laughs> so and he was one of those personalities that his personality was contagious right uh, some people call it charisma he had so even yeah. though he was sharing something that maybe people weren't interested in you couldn't be offended by him because of no because doing. it was very direct and very um basically was take it or leave it you know here's the story and i reflect on it now brother how it's kind of like joseph smith's conversion story or his testimony he, if you read that first vision testimony he's just telling facts right he's not making up there's not anything in there that's made up or fluff or over dramatization or any of that any of that stuff and if you read it or, and, you, and you ponder it, it has a ring of truth. Um, it's like a counterfeit coin. You take up a counterfeit coin, you, you bite it. It doesn't just taste right. You know, right. There's something wrong with it. But you flip this coin and it sounded right. It was logical and it couldn't come at a better time for me. Wow. So, so now that you and... Uh, Nail are members of the church, um, and you had, did. Did y'all have a child at that time? We had Is one daughter, had one daughter, okay, uh, Kimberly, who's now almost fifty years old. Gotcha. Okay, and we had three other children: Ben, who uh, we had a tragic loss of Ben in uh, two thousand seven. Ben disappeared, and we never found him. So it's been a major, major. A tragedy in our life and a major burden right emotional burden more than anything and then we've had uh, two other children a daughter molly and a son john uh, we were all very active in the church for oh i say a span of about 20 years and then over the years uh, the only one that's really active now my my daughter uh, kim out in salt lake so okay uh, John, Molly, yeah, and of course Ben is gone. So right. The um, so you had mentioned um, about uh, uh, service in the in the church. You've you served as a, as a stake president, as a, a bishop, uh, branch president, and kind yeah, of everywhere I went. You know, we with my career with NCIS, it seemed like every we got transferred about every three years. That was the norm. If you wanted to get promoted, you had to. Move you would be willing to move. move that's right yeah in your career i think you probably yeah. the same thing you probably got to go to atlanta you right get, if you're going to get promoted so i was trying to get promoted at the same time not to shoot my wife in the foot with her career her, right so i tried to strategically move uh, we ended up my first move was to scotland uh, i got on with ncis in charleston south carolina got transferred overseas you know ncis is all, all over the world them. and i was intrigued by my family name and family history my color mm -hmm. and our ancestry being scots and irish i wanted to go to scotland so we ended up there two and a half years so and uh, there and then uh I forget the other line of your questioning. So I was I was going to ask about this with the amount of service that that you and Nell have put in. You know what have what what have y'all taken from that or learned from that as you've as you've served in, in the church and uh, I can take the this. Now. The church will uh, will definitely challenge you. I was in the church six months, brand new uh, priest, and then 
They may have been the elder after a year, I think, mm -hmm. it was a year in the church. And within 18 months, I was called to be the branch president of the Live Oak. Within 18 months? 18 months. Wow. And I didn't have a clue how to spell branch president. Right. <laughs> and uh, it was somewhat overwhelming. Being yeah, a new, new absolutely. Convert. I was there uh, for three years, got transferred to Charleston. Now, let, let me pause you there for a second. So that you were in live now, was this your hometown again? Where yeah. we're, we're all where they where you had a lot of strong opposition yeah. about being so you're you're back in Live Oak now. Back in Live Oak. And and now you're not only a member of the church, you're now serving as the branch president. Right. Wow. I started out with the Flourishers Boys Ranch, went to the Department of Corrections because I got offered a little raise right. in Lake Butler, Florida. Came back to Live Oak because a state attorney hired me as an investigator. Okay. So we're back in Live Oak and uh, had I was called to be branch president. Nell was in Relief Society primary overseas. Uh, well, I was called to be bishop in uh, Charleston. Okay. In my second year, uh, had a very short stint there, only two years because we got transferred to Scotland. Went to Scotland. I replaced the branch president over there and came back and uh, went to Panama City, Florida. Served on the high council. And uh, then after four years, went to Virginia. I was the stake mission president. And it's just continued. Most yeah. of it's been leadership. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So y'all are, so from the, from the get go, Lord is, Lord has asked a, he's a asked a lot, a lot. Yeah. A lot. Uh, but you know, you never turn down or you don't wish to turn down. Right. Sometimes there are circumstances where you feel the person extending the call doesn't fully, know fully, fully grasp right? yeah. what, what you're dealing with. Right. So yeah. I've turned down one call in my life or I told him I'd like for him to rethink it. Right. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. Well, you had, uh, so you'd mentioned about, about your son, the disappearance of your son and everything. And um, I know that's been a, a, a tragic uh, event that you and Neil have had to deal with. If, if you would just tell us a little bit of, uh, about that, how that kind of the story behind it and everything. And, Okay, uh, we were living in Brunswick, Georgia. I was working as an instructor at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. My son had graduated, gone to Valdosta State University. He did not serve a mission. He got immediately into uh, the construction business. He had a business degree, but he felt he wanted to own his own company. He didn't want to work for the other person or right. for himself. Very bright young man. Um, did extremely well. Did all of his financing. Built, I think he built maybe six or seven homes. Okay. Starting to get a reputation as a really good builder. And uh, Ben had a, a drinking problem. Uh, he was semi-active in the church, but I think his drinking problem was the fatal issue. Um, it was in 2007 that um, he had built his own home up in Darien, Georgia. And one night he uh, called his girlfriend late at night that he had given out of gas. And could she come pick him up? We didn't know a thing about it. We're in Waycross. Right. Um, to make a longer story short, she, for some reason, did not go pick him up. I think there was an argument. She didn't want to go pick him up. But late at, it was late at night. Right. So the next morning, uh, one of his friends with the Georgia uh, Department, what was the Georgia Power, was driving by and saw his pickup truck abandoned on the side of the road. So, you know, we began searching for Ben. His keys are in the truck, doors open, and uh, he's missing. So we launch a massive family surge. Church members started helping us. Can't find Ben anywhere. 
you know, 24 hours go by, 36, 72. The police got involved, the sheriff's department in McIntosh County got involved early on. And they treated it like just a disappearance or a missing person. Um, and then leads begin to come in that maybe this, maybe that theories. Right. We started doing massive searches from the perimeter of where his truck was found abandoned with his foot and uh, all-terrain vehicles went out. All uh, directions. All directions, yeah. four or five miles. We had over 100 volunteers looking for him, you know, thinking maybe foul play, somebody knocked him in the head. Right. Uh, that went on for six weeks or so. Then we got the military involved, and they got helicopters and infrared lights and looking for heat sources and right. cadaver dogs and, you know, you, you name it. Since I was in CIS, I had a lot of contact. Oh, right. So GBI got involved, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, uh, FBI got involved. Uh, they were doing it as a favor for me, to me to help find Ben, find right. what happened. About the same time, there was a double murder over in uh, Ludowici, yeah. Georgia. Mm -hmm. And they thought there was some link to that. It was the same kind of mysterious disappearance of a young woman, the same within like a 24 hour period. So they thought maybe it was robbery gone bad or whatever. Never came up with a, a prime suspect, but they had all these theories that, and had all these uh, soothsayers and uh, Ouija board readers and people come out of the woodwork. Psychics want to get with you for money. Right. Uh, we put up at rewards, you know, but we wouldn't listen to these psychics as most of them were. Some of them were local people that were just goof, goofballs. Yeah. So, like a long story short, uh, after over, I'd say about a year and a half of extensive investigation, cold case investigation, both NCIS, FBI, we even hired a uh, outside contractor. Probably like a private. Yeah, private detective to see if they could uncover anything and nothing. Uh, so we've been dealing with the emotional trauma of it. You can imagine what you reflect upon most, Jackson, is when your children are young, you know, and you right. see them do things when they're young, swimming or boating or whatever. And you remember the good time. Ben was 32 years old, so he was an adult. And he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And we assume that. We assume the worst. Uh, GBI has assumed the worst. Uh, we recently, just uh, it was like eight months ago, submitted uh, DNA samples. They found human remains off the coast of Darien, Georgia, and Lent, that's where right, Ben yeah. was fairly close within a two mile radius of where Ben went missing. A fisherman found uh, some remains uh, up in the shoreline. Uh, unfortunately, it was only bones and no no flesh, no nothing. Uh, but uh, GBI retrieved the, the cadaver and sent it off to a lab with our DNA. Right. See if we can get a match. Uh, just for closure. You know, yeah, absolutely. It's That's, been almost 10 years. We haven't had closure. It's over right, 10 years. Yeah. We had a memorial service, but, you know, I can tell you what it's like for those who are interested in the feeling. It's, it's like a double shotgun blast to the head emotionally to deal with it because that's your child. Right. And you you beat yourself up with guilt. Well, maybe if I'd have been more on top of Ben's alcohol problem, or maybe if I'd been there closer, or, or something, or supported him more. 
but we did, you know, we were extreme supporters of Ben. It just was a bad, bad, bad day. And it's been a bad 15 years. Yeah, and yeah. We still haven't had any closure. Right. So the only thing that has kept us afloat is the gospel in our, you know, belief in the afterlife. And we've had many dreams and visions. Not, I won't say visions, but we've had many dreams and feelings and right. things that have happened that we know that Ben's, Ben's fine. Right. Um, well, I can imagine that in a situation like that, that you've got to be able to have something to turn to and hold on to. And the, the gospel of Jesus Christ in this situation would, would be the natural. Well, there's, there's a few things uh, if I can share. Number one, when you have a tragedy like that happens, uh, you have instant empathy for other people who go through similar circumstances. Right. So I know people even in our ward that in our local area yeah. here have lost a husband, two, two daughters, and a son when it's like a three-year period, uh, but in different circumstances. Ours was this trauma. We don't know what happened. Right. The unknown. But prayer, going to the temple, sincerely uh, accepting your wheelchair. And what I mean by that is that we've been given this extreme challenge and uh, we're not paralyzed. Well, we have three other children that are living and you begin to count your blessings and you begin to look deeper into the meaning of life. Uh, what is life all about? You know, it's an individual test meant for the capacity of each person. See, my son, who is now deceased, we think, that was his test. His test was alcoholism, and he he didn't he didn't make it. We feel like that was a contributing factor. Right. Um, so, and uh, being willing to talk about it, and uh, this may sound odd, but find a sense of humor in life, not on his, not on being missing. Right. But they say that uh, laughter is the mistress of sorrow. You know, I've had to find laughter and humor and be around upbeat, happy people. Uh, when you deal with a friend or relative that loses a loved one, be there with loving empathy. Right. But also teach them to look on you're still living right yeah you still need to contribute let me ask you this so with uh with you and and nail uh, obviously people react different ways to to similar situations how have you and nail uh been able to help each other support each other through through this no, our, our depth of our love for one another. Uh, I think anybody who knows me know that Nell is a pinnacle of my life and my children and my family uh, is the most dear, precious thing on this planet to me. You just know when the mate, your mate is emotionally not right. And you know when to back off and you know when to, encourage you know when to distract right, right you know when to do something new and fun right and you know how to mourn with her there's been periods where uh, to this day i mean to this week uh, Nell had a bad week last week about ben and uh, she had kind of an epiphany in bed uh, a couple of weeks ago where she felt that she was conversing with ben beyond the veil and she uh, had a very rough uh, three or four days, but she came out of it because we stay busy and we, we cling to each other and we cling to the core doctrines of the church. Right. I, th I think, I think uh, especially in, in that 
in y'all situation there. And again, for, for everybody, cause we, we all have different challenges, just like if you mentioned different situations that people have, uh, I think of president Hinckley when, and him talking about spouses and everything, he says, if, if everyone would be make their spouse, that their, their spouse's, uh, well-being, their number one concern, then, then divorces and everything and strife within marriages would, would, wouldn't go away, uh, wouldn't exist like, like, like they do today. And I think in this situation here with you and Nell turning towards each other and having the concern for each other has, uh, I would, I would think has been a, a big help. In it, it is. And, uh, Nell is my hero. You know, you think being a pro football player and, NCIS criminal criminology major, I'd be a pretty tough guy. Right. But uh, if I had to measure innate toughness with my toughness to nails, uh, she'd win out. I mean, there's only two people I'm really scared of God and nails. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I, I don't mean really mean in that order. Right, 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 right. I hear you. I hear you. Let, let me ask you this. Uh, maybe one more question about, about that. Did you ever, have you ever had, had the question of why, why us, why did, why did this happen? Or, you know, did it, any, any blame of any kind, you know, towards God or anything like that? Yes. Uh, why? I still ask that question and I have moments where I pray in the woods or I'm off by myself saying, you know, what is the lesson I'm supposed to learn here? Why do I have to endure this, the unknown? Why did my bright son have to succumb to alcoholism and die in such a tragic manner? And you begin to get revelation, inspiration on not so much the why, but and Joseph Smith was told, if you endure it well, you know, you got to endure it well, not just wine and right. carry on right you have to endure it well um, i feel that the savior's atonement when i think about the atonement uh, the only time in the history of scripture in the church that you can find where jesus demonstrated a little bit of doubt even he appeared some doubt. Uh, if this cup can pass, you know, right, right. He said, "If this could pass, but nevertheless, thy will be done." Uh, and at one point, he he expressed, "Why hast thou forsaken me?" Right. Uh, I've been there. I've been there in that hole. There's a hole in your bucket. There's nothing that can fill it up until this life is over and you know that, hey, this was for a reason. And we're all reconciled with God saying, this is for your your growth and your development. Uh, remember, I gave my son. Yeah. Uh, but yes, to be painfully honest, there's been times when a person, like in my situation, losing Ben, or you're bitter about life for whatever reason, divorce or loss of income or whatever. You want to stick your finger in God's chest. You want to say, right. You know, why'd you do this? And I've come to the realization. It's not smart to stick your finger in God's chest. Uh, what, what is smart is to endure it. And try to f f try to find rationale and reasoning in it, you know. Uh, what I a, a great um, comfort to me is that there's things that are worse than death. Uh, you know, dying and then dying in complete abstract guilt of sins. You know, right? And yeah, having to overcome that. Right. Yeah, and I think that's what uh, that's that's the blessing of the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing that when we do pass away, that it's it's not the end. You know, if we've you know done all that we can to yeah. to, to turn to Christ and and have Him be a uh, the biggest part of our lives, uh, for sure. Yeah. 
And God, in his tender mercies, like Elder Bednar talks about tender mercies in one of his talks, that from time to time you get these little things that happen that say to your mind and your soul, see there, I was with you all along. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do this. It's like we talk, we're speaking to a child, and we're like children compared to God's intelligence. And there's something about the suffering that we don't comprehend, you know. Right. We don't comprehend it. Why would God allow his firstborn to go through this excruciating, horrible, incomprehensible pain that we can't even begin to think about? Right. It? But it was for his own good. Yeah. So I keep holding on to that, that some good's going to come out of this. Maybe it's the number of people that Nell and I have talked to since been disappearance that have had tragedy, and they say, you just don't know. I say, yes, yeah, we do yeah, know. Yeah. We do know. Yeah. And you share your story, and they say, well, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, being able to provide that that comfort and everything that uh, that, that other people other people think is good. Um. Well, we'll uh, we'll move on. Um, the uh, we got some pretty exciting news uh, in this past conference with the uh, announcement of the temple to be built in uh, Tallahassee. So, right. what, what, what were your being being you know from that area playing college football there and have that, that be was a big a very party exciting life? thing? Now I'll tell you when we we were watching TV at home at the conference when it was announced and. I literally jumped out of my chair right. and whooped like we just scored in the Super Bowl. That, yeah, yeah. And uh, we're excited about the opportunity. We, we hope there's not a delay. Nell and I are definitely making plans for a temple mission. That's what we want to do. Right. We've got a little handicap. We, we're trying to raise a granddaughter. we got to get that fixed. And we don't really want to move, but we're thinking about a move to Tallahassee has to be so we can be right there. there. And it would kind of be a crowning event, I think, on my Real, life yeah. if we could serve a honorable temple mission of three or four years. Right. And well, I know uh, just you know being around y'all and, and serving with y'all, y'all you've always had a strong desire to to serve in the temple and have, and have done a good bit uh, uh, serving in the in the Orlando uh, temple and everything. So, yeah, it's very disappointing right now. All you can do is research, and, right? And uh, you hope that you know all the research will come to fruition that you can do the work actually for the people that, right? So, absolutely. But yes, to answer your question, very excited about the temple. It was, what is it, two and a half hours now? Right, exactly. Yeah, versus it's an hour, basically an hour shorter. It's about three and a half, three hours, 45 minutes, kind of depending on who's driving. Everything. Matter of fact, Nell and I, we had planned this a couple of months back. We're going to Tallahassee tomorrow. Okay. And we're going to go to church uh, at the, where the, right across the road from the, Temple site is a big a church, yeah, big, big ward building, and we have some friends there. We're going to go visit with them and ask a few questions, kick a few tires. Right, absolutely. Um, do, is there a, is there an expected completion date or anything like that that, that you know of? Have you heard? I haven't heard, but the norm is two to three years. Okay, but, but this COVID thing, right now, it's at the uh, approval through the city ordinance. Okay. thing you know permits to build and, right but they they don't expect any opposition on that so okay. gotcha. they're they're thinking you know by spring we'll be breaking big uh, ground back right that's uh, that, that's exciting i know uh i know there was a lot of kind of speculation whether it whether whenever a temple was announced for northern florida we, we expected it at some point but there was jacksonville tallahassee in my mind tallahassee makes the, the 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 most sense geographically speaking you know uh you think about it you're basically on the georgia florida line you're like midway between atlanta and orlando temple it's about four hour four and a half hours gotcha. each way so the people on the western part of the panhandle 
the closest temple was uh, New Orleans, you know. The, okay. The very closest temple. And the, the north was Birmingham. Birmingham, right. Birmingham. So Birmingham still five-hour drive north from okay. Tallahassee because there's no interstate that particular right, way. Right, right. And uh, then going to the west, there's nothing out there. You got some pretty major cities like Pensacola and different cities. that right. Uh, uh, no, it's at Baton Rouge. It's the Baton Rouge Temple in Louisiana. Okay. And both of those are very small temples. So I think the Tallahassee Temple is going to be a little bit bigger than the the tiniest temple. Okay. At least the drawings that I saw in, or the architect rendering. Right. Gotcha. It's going to be a little bit bigger. Um. Well, to kind of wrap this up, there were a couple of things that I wanted to uh, mention. Um, as you played your four years, Florida State University football uh, defense, right? Defensive lineman, is that correct? Linebacker. Linebacker, okay. And uh, you hold uh, – <laughs> how many records do you hold at, at FSU? Two. I hold the uh, single-game record for number of tackles at 29. Wow. Which – I just had a recent article just a couple of months ago, which is really surprising. It's still getting print on stuff like that, but uh, they don't think that record's going to be broken. It's it, going to be very difficult to break. Uh, I made 26 tackles against Florida the game before. Wow. And then the next game, I made 29. So, so, so it was 26. Was that a record? That was a record. record. Okay. That was All a right. record. And then I broke my own record. Nice. And then I had six uh, tackles for a loss, which is a record. Okay. Uh, against Memphis State, 1967. Gotcha. They didn't count it as sacks because they count sacks as drop back pass, you know, drop back pass. Right, right. Um, they were running the option play okay. a lot. And I blew up the – Option play six times on the on the corner, you know. Right. And now, <clears throat> and was that uh, something that you kind of dreamt about growing up playing playing college football, NFL, or is that something just kind of? Well, happened? to tell you the truth, I was I was very thin. You can't believe it now, but I, I was six two, and I weighed like a hundred and seventy nine pound, hundred eighty pound. And in high school, I was called Pond Bird because I had real skinny legs. Right. I had a big upper torso, and I was quick. I wasn't fast, but I was quick. Okay. And I didn't think I was going to get recruited. What actually happened, I learned uh, from a high school coach 20 years after my pro career was over. He said, Dale, I want to tell you the truth. They didn't really want you. At the FSU, and I said, "Well, thanks, <laughs> thanks for giving me that news." He said they wanted Johnny Hurst, the running back, and they told me that if I would, they would recruit both of us if Johnny would go to FSU. Huh? So it was a package deal I knew nothing about. Interesting, and. Uh, John, this Johnny Hurst was an exceptional athlete. He could do anything, just anything. And I had to work for mine. You know, right, I really right, had to right. work at it. I think through work ethic and some spiritual help. See, I'm convinced that record of 29 tackles was not coincidence either. There were there were things that happened that particular day. I had a uh, teammate who was active in the fellowship of christian athletes handed me a piece of paper and a piece of paper right before the game he said you're going to make national line of the week today i said yeah right really yeah he did and the people the piece of paper said uh, philippians 4 13 which is i can do all things through christ which strengtheneth me and I can't really explain it, but I felt when I stepped on the field that particular game, I felt like I was uh, 
the Incredible Hulk. Oh, right, yeah. I felt like the Incredible Hulk. I felt like I was I was invincible. I just felt that way. And everywhere I went on the field, the ball carrier ran into me. Ran into me. Right, yeah. <laughs> the receivers <laughs> ran into me. It's interesting. And, over and over again. So, I mean, if I didn't make the tackle, I would have looked silly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that, that guy was providing a little bit of prophecy that day, evidently. Well, and I made national line of the week and my mother, and this is tough to say, but I'm, I'm revealing myself here. My mother was in a mental institution and she got to see me play that game. It was on national TV. So I had motivation for mom. Right. Who had never saw she'd never seen me play college ball. She'd seen me play high school, but never saw me play a college game. She got to see me on national TV. Very cool. So all those forces came together and I don't I don't claim any credit other than being in the way. Gotcha. I was in the way. way. Well that's <laughs> like how you put that. And and isn't there a book that you were involved in? Uh Yes, as as- one of my coworkers, our co teammates, Johnny Crow, who was a celebrated, gifted man. He was CEO of Buckeye Technologies and uh, has a master's in uh, mathematics. And, uh, very wealthy man. Um, I felt inspired one day to give him a call. I said, "Listen, I think." Uh, People are forgetting the legacy that the 60s, the decade of the 60s, of people that laid the groundwork for Florida State and Bobby Bowden in that era, you know. Right, right. We laid the groundwork. Right. You know? And we had some pretty successful team. You know, we were eight and eight and two and nine and one. Okay. That's a pretty good team. And uh, we brought Florida State to the forefront. So, I asked him about would he consider co-writing a book with me. And he said, no, I don't think I have time. I said, well, just think about it. So a couple of weeks later, he calls me. He said, you know, I think you're right. I think we'll, we'll try this. So we had a flurry of about a year writing this book, doing research. We went and interviewed 12 uh, defensive players over the 60s, the decade of the 60s. Right. And we called the book uh, Sons of the 60s, A Case for Defense. Okay. Emphasizing how national championships today are really won by defense. You know, and Super Bowls are run by defense. Right. I don't know if you noticed. Right. Defense won that game. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. They shut down and Kansas City. You look historically, uh, if the team can't score, they can't win. So we interviewed Bobby Bowden. We interviewed different coaches. And uh, we made the case in our book that defensive players, like Bobby Bowden, for instance, said he put the best players on defense uh, on all of his team because he knew that if he could stop the opponent and they could get one or two touchdowns, they could win. Win, right. So that was the philosophy behind it. We were able to identify 12 Hall of Fame players. Johnny was a Hall of Fame player. He was a defensive back. I was okay. a Hall of Fame player. And we identified 12 Hall of Fame players on defense. That's right. And uh, we made the case that, hey, we laid the ground for work for, you know, quit losing. <laughs> <laughs> quit losing, particularly against Florida. That's, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, never, so that's Sons of the 60s, a case for defense. Yeah. Very good. Well, that's that's pretty cool. I have to have to check that We've out. We've been real yeah. f- fortunate on all the proceeds for the book go to uh, Johnny Stevens Scholarship Fund. Okay. Johnny Stevens was a player that played center on FSU's team from 65 to 69. He went to Vietnam first year he was killed in action uh, while on patrol in wow. Vietnam. He was well loved by all of his teammates, me included. So we, all the money we get from this book goes to the Johnny uh, Stevens Scholarship. That's Fund. wonderful. So right now we've raised my last count from Johnny, my uh, co-author, said 
we've raised about $32,000. Wow. It takes 50000 to supply a scholarship. Okay. For four years. Gotcha. So our goal is fifty grand. So well, that's a that's a great cause right there for so sure. We haven't got rich, but we're we're uh, we're gonna, gonna somebody's gonna get a scholarship. Well, that's wonderful. That's good. That's good. Well, I got uh, I got two more questions for you. We'll uh, then we'll close it out. Uh, first one is is can can the Lord require too much of us? You want to know the human answer? Yes. The human answer is yes. You've required way too much for me to handle this. You know, Moses said, I, I'm dumb. I can't speak. You know, I'm illiterate. Why you want to choose me? I want to run. Um, throughout history, there's been prophets say, you know, I don't think I want to do this. Right. Um, Peter denied Christ three times. Uh, you know, he showed his weakness. And we all have these moments that why me? Why would you choose me? Uh, the bottom line, in, in my case, I was a little farm boy from North Florida who worked in tobacco every year, cropping tobacco, driving tractors, uh, and how the Lord can use you over my church resume. I've served from branch president to bishop to stake president to counselor, high counselor, custodian. Right. I've been a custodian in the church. Uh, the Lord's going to find a place to put you that you can contribute in a meaningful way. And uh, the, the bottom line, I wouldn't trade the church experience for anything. Mm -hmm. Everything I owe besides Nell, everything I owe to me being any kind of success in life has been to the church, the teachings of the church. church yeah. It's kept me channeled in the right That's direction. Mm -hmm. And before I joined the church, I was involved in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. If I hadn't been involved with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, I would have been a worse drunk. Okay, but the Christian, the core doctrines right. changes your behavior. Right. You know, you, your focus. You want right. to do things. Well, the uh, the the last question is, and kind of the, one of the the basis of our podcast show and everything we do is is finding joy in, in living the gospel through through all the difficult circumstances that you and your family have been through. Um, how have you continued to find joy? In, in, the, in the gospel? I find it through uh, deep pondering and seeking answers from a higher source, our Heavenly Father. Um, there's a scripture, in the world you shall have, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. It's let me know that joy is just part of it in this life. See, I think we're supposed to be tested. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's an extreme test. And I, I, I'll be very honest with you. There's been times when I, I want to throw up my hands when we lost Ben, for instance, right. and say, I don't get this. I don't, I don't understand this, you know. I need help. I need emotional, I need spiritual help. And you reach down in those darkest hours. I mean, I've had some dark, dark hours with losing my son. Mm -hmm. Those darkest hours, that still small voice says, it's going to be all right. You're going to make it. This is for you. And the test is designed for you. It's designed for me. You know, the thing I hate is collateral damage. My wife being damaged, or right. me, me being damaged, you know, my children being damaged. Uh, my children still hurt for their brother. Right. You know? So, yeah. but to answer your question in a simple way, I know God is there and I know He cares, but. For some reason, I can't quit. I can't quit. 
Very good. Well, I think that's a uh, that's a that's a, a great way to end it. Um, I know I, I appreciate your your thoughts, your your testimony, your encouragement, and and wisdom, and everything that you that you've provided today. So, uh, Dale, I just want to well, thank, thank you for thank for you for interviewing show. me, and hope that someone will get some benefit from it. And pick yeah, a, pick a people that are suffering or dealing with loss of loved one, particularly during this COVID right experience. That right. You realize that this life is so short and fleeting, you know. Yeah. I remember looking like you one day. Right. <laughs> I don't look like you anymore. I don't look good. Now. I don't look good anymore. I hear you. Nah, you always look good. Thank you so much, Dale. All right. Thank you. All right, everyone. Hope you enjoyed that interview. I just wanted to give a plug for the uh, book that is available for purchase on Amazon.com. I'm going to place a link in the uh, description and the uh, title of it is Sons of the 60s, A Case for Defense. As he mentioned, it's based on the the defenses of the 60s, the great defense that he was a part of, the great teams there at Florida State University, and uh, how they kind of laid the the foundation there for the great Bobby Bowden teams and um, and just talking about how how the defenses win championships. And uh, remember that all the proceeds actually go toward a – Johnny Stevens Scholarship Fund, who was a teammate uh, of Del McCullers and others uh, who ended up being killed in battle uh, there in Vietnam. So uh, great reason to purchase the book. And and again, the link will be in the description there. So click on it and uh, take a look. And until next time, y'all keep on striving. <laughs>